Um, so we have three breakout questions. The first one being, what is the thesis of the reading as long, along with the contemporary analysis for the reading? Uh, what does the thesis say about the possibilities of race relations within the United States? And then finally, what stood out to you most about the reading? Uh, who would like to share their thesis and their contemporary analysis? Uh, Amelia, if possible, I would, could you just say that out loud so that way we could hear you, if possible? Uh, in my group, we were talking about the the kind of cultural influence that migration and travel can have on um on other cultural groups. And Lawrence White was in my um in my breakout room, and he had mentioned a great example of the water jugs that Hispanic cultures use, um, and they usually carry them on their head, which was in the reading kind of mentioned that it's a similarity from the African culture as well that we caught from them. Okay, dope. Thank you for that. Uh, anyone want to share what they felt was their contemporary analysis for the reading? How does it relate to what's going on in our world today? Uh, that there's like a lot of ignorance within like cultures that you know some people want to say that it's theirs like it's oh this is my for my people when in, in reality like it's adopted or it's like you know inherited or influenced by by you know people migrating and traveling and trading with others okay thank you uh Gianna? um when my takeaway was that um like I don't know how to say it like that um back then like the these traders were wearing like certain articles of clothing and they were judged for it, and people had assumptions about them and how today people still have assumptions and negative connotations for um black individuals and it's crazy how it stems to even as even before Columbus where people were making assumptions about them Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, so let's jump into the second question. Um, what does the thesis say about the possibilities of race relations within the United States, thinking particularly of uh, Black and Indigenous relations or so-called Hispanic or so-called Mexican relations? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would maybe mention that, you know, there's this idea of like, uh, citizens or, um, you know, belonging to the land, but I think because of the readings like these, we were able to see that, um, you know, there were, there were, um, the West Africans kind of were here first, you know, it speaks on them being, or sorry, I, I'm talking about, uh, medieval, like Mexico, Mexico, mm -hmm. um, you know, they talk about like they, they were there first and it's like there's clear signs and they can't ignore it. And I think when you relate it to now, it's this idea that, oh, well, you're an immigrant for, you know, migrating maybe even back to this land or, you know, migrating to this land. And it's like they, there shouldn't one, there really shouldn't be a division like that. But if there is a division, you know, let, let's keep let's keep it a buck and let's uh, let's be honest. They were here first and therefore they shouldn't be seen as immigrants if we were to see it in that picture. But Perfect. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Not to kind of go off topic, but um, I was watching this documentary as well while I was reading the um, the uh, sorry, the this. I can't even talk right. What was it called again? The, okay. the reading assignment? Columbus. The what? They came before Columbus? Oh, yeah, that's, yes. They came before Columbus. While I was reading that and watching the documentary, I had noticed um, that the documentary talked about how there are still Native American, I mean, Native or Indigenous Mexicans that have African ancestry because of the um, immigration of the West Africans. And because of the uh, immigration of the West Africans, um, the first president of Mexico, who was of African descent, he... Um, 
he made it to where the Mexican country was a free country for Africans. So when the slaves had um, escaped to Mexico, they were deemed free people. So I thought that was pretty cool. And how deep so, African history. So taking that, Michelle, and which you just informed us on, um, and I think it, it relates, not off topic. Um, okay. What does that say about the possibilities for the way that Black folks in California and indigenous folks or so-called Mexican or so-called Hispanic folks in California mm -hmm. today can get along. Wait, sorry, repeat that again. You cut so, off. Based off of what you said, right? That, um, you know, indigenous Mexico provided refuge for the enslaved Africans to come and, and, and be safe, right? Right. Um, the first president of Mexico, in fact, was an African descended man or an African presenting man. Mm -hmm. So taking that information, what does that information say about the possibilities of the way that Black folks and Hispanic, so-called Hispanic folks, could get along here in California? Um, there's a huge possibility. Um, if we, if if Black people in California are willing to look at the history of Blacks and Mexicans, and vice versa. If Hispanic people in California are able to look at how deep our histories are intertwined, then I feel like we we as a community can come together and become one of the most powerful. Um, so I, I believe that it deeply affects us today. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else? What does the reading say about the possibilities for the ways that Black folks and Indigenous folks could get along? I feel like today in um, our society, um, Black and Mexican, Hispanic, Latin, Latinx, you know, the whole culture in general, I feel like we've kind of created a, some type of alliance just with everyday um, experiences. I don't know if it's been for everyone, but co coming from... Um, where I'm from, there is a lot, like a huge population of both Hispanic and Black people. And we kind of just co-lived in like this kind of, um, like, like it was a very diverse and accepting community kind of. But there were also some differences to where we kind of are bu butting heads with each other fighting like kind of who has it worse you know um and I feel like that's kind of something that has been going on for a while to where you know it's kind of just been this like battle of the minoritized and um I feel like it kind of um puts a, a halt or like some type of obstacle whenever it comes to actually what Ma uh, Michelle was saying was kind of bringing us together because at the end of the day we were both you know intertwined in the beginning of it all so I feel like like she said um we should go back to thinking to how all of this all of us as we know it as it as we were created started from us intertwining and kind of mixing in each other's cultures you know, it started as united, so I feel like it should have stayed united okay. and can stay united. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Shot. Uh, Gianna? I think, um, like, Hispanic communities and Black communities can relate in how, um, in America, um, not everyone accepts them being here or has, like, um, maybe, like, not, just not feeling, like, welcome even though they do belong here and this land is as, as much theirs as it is everyone else's and how they can relate on certain like economical uh, issues or um, just how um, the government or people in power don't necessarily help them as much as other communities. Um, so I think they could relate on things like that. So thinking about what Gianna is saying, right? She's saying um, there's both have shared experiences, right? They, they both operate as these oppressed communities and oftentimes receive the same treatment from the power structures, right? Um, and, and when I was listening to um, Shai, what I heard her uh, discussing is what's called oppression Olympics, 
right? Oh, my community got it worse than yours, right? Oh, the Jewish Holocaust was worse than the African Ma'afa, right? These are these modes of what's called oppression Olympics. Who is the most oppressed? Uh, Michelle? Um, also, during the reading, I've noticed, um, and, and going back to the thesis, uh, that Black and Hispanics uh, if there's a possibility, there there is a huge possibility because look at our religion, look at the African religion and the indigenous religion. They were similar. Look at their gods. They were of a sim of a of they they were built similarly. Their deities were like almost identical. And I, if only we could teach um, black and Hispanics in California that today, maybe they would they can see each other as equal and not have such animosity and. Um, thinking who who's who's the more oppressed group you know i, I want to kind of further complicate our conversation because i think we're, we're ruminating in a really good space but let me kind of further complicate what's the issue what's the issue with the term hispanic why is that problematic hispanic <laughs> What country came in to colonize Spain? So break that word down. Oh, Hispania, Spania. Oh, okay. Indigenous, can I say Mexican? I mean, because not all Latinos or Latinx are Mexican. Right. No, you're right. You're right. And, and, without, and the reason why I bring this up, not to say that you're wrong, Michelle, but mm -hmm. what happens when you use terms like Hispanic, right? Mm -hmm is you're identifying with the European oppressor who colonized the indigenous people, right? Even the language of Spanish is not, is, is a, it's a colonial language. Like, let's not be confused about that. Spanish is a colonial language, right? So to call yourself Hispanic, I'm a product of Spain. So what is the proper way to... Um... I mean, for me, I say indigenous, right? Because what indigenous. that concept is, these are the original people of this land, right? They're indigenous to this area. They're indigenous to this region. And that that goes beyond just so-called Mexicans, right? Because if you look at the historically of the, the history of so-called Mexican folks, right? It's the indigenous people who have been blended with Spanish people, right? This is how you produce what we now know as what are or uh, we call Mexicans, but to me, they're indigenous, they're native, they're the original inhabitants of this land. So I refer to them as indigenous and that's all encompassing to all people who are native to North and South America. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and I'm not saying I'm the um, utmost knowledge on that. If somebody knows better than I do, please let me know and please correct me if I'm wrong. That's not my research, that's not my background, but this is what I've known through conversations and, and uh, discussions with other people who identify as indigenous. Um, okay. What stood out to you in the reading? Anything that stood out to anyone in the reading? Um, to me, uh, what stood out was how um, when they mentioned how the Mandingo, um, I think it was, uh, when they when they came in as traders, they did like came in with peace, you know, and there was no colonization or all this war. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, what I started thinking about was how colonization, as soon as they came in, it's just all disaster. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm hearing in your um, statement, Joseph, is just like the distinction between how African people traveled outside of Africa and how they interacted with the um, individuals who they came in contact with is separate from how Europeans did. Right. When, when the Europeans traveled, when they migrated, um, they came with the desire to conquest. They came with the desire to destroy. Right. Um, vastly different from how African people came into these spaces. Perfect. Uh, anyone else? What stood out to you in the reading? <laughs> Um, for me, what stood out, wait, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what stood out to me in the reading was like, I think it was in the beginning um, where there's this narration and the person's basically saying how like when they first came into contact with these people of African descent, um, there was a sort of like attention that was being drawn to them. 
and it wasn't because of their like different skin tone or anything like that it was because of the way like they presented themselves through their arts and like their abilities and that like really took me back to what we were saying about how intelligent people of African descent are and that was totally like showcased through their presentation in these new lands so that's something that stood out to me Perfect. Like, I mean, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, like their identity was like not reduced to their skin tone, but like who they actually were. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say. That's a great call out. And, and for me, that also lets me know that you've done a very close read and you're absolutely right. Um, and it says in the text, right? Of course, foreigners are going to look different, but what distinguished them is how they adorned themselves, right? The goods that they brought to trade. Right. So to know, to, to know, Alan, to know Lonnie's point, excuse me, um, they humanized them. They seen them as individuals, right? The color of their skin did not demarcate them to an inhuman status, right? They seen beyond difference and allowed their culture to take place and, and be um, appreciated. So that's a very good call out. All right. Um, what we've read is uh, they came before Columbus, uh, the uh, African presence in early Americas and ancient Americas. Um, the author is Ivan Van Sertima. Um, on Wednesday, when we go to the um, lecture, they will be talking about some of Van Sertima's work. Um, Anthony Browder is a, is a historian, um, brilliant historian. I actually got a chance to hear his lecture when I went to Ghana uh, two years ago. Um, but getting into the text, right? Um, mm, I'm gonna read the first, I'm gonna read uh, aspects of two paragraphs on page 93. I'm looking at um, the middle of page 93 uh, with a sentence that starts, these black merchants from the hot lands sold vivid colored mantles of cotton cloth. The cloaks so richly dyed, they seemed to occupy the iridescent plumages of the birds, so various in design that the radial wheel of the sun, feathers and stylized shells of their skin, uh, of sorry, shells, the skin of tigers, the forms of rabbits, snakes, fishes, and butterflies mingled in the myriad of motifs with triangles, polygons, crosses, squares, and crescents. Together, these garments they brought into the marketplace, golden ear pendants, smoking pipes, pipes, some with the heads of, of the traders carved on the bowl, exotic stone shells, right? So again, back to um, Nolani's point, right? There's the difference, but then again, how they're presenting themselves, how they're choosing to adorn themselves, right? Um, their knack and their desire for aesthetics, right? Um, the subsequent paragraph, and this talks about how they begin to arrive into this region. They came at first in twos, and then in a small band, their coming attracted attention, but this was less because of their extraordinariness of their appearance, Foreigners, after all, were expected to look different than the extraordinariness of their wares. Some of the luxuries they offered in the common marketplace had been enjoyed almost exclusively by the noblemen and kings of Mexico, who seemed to have had some earlier contact with them. In the, re in the reign of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's Faza uh, Peconic, I, I don't know. Um, they suddenly appeared, they, the spearhead of a larger migrating group, out of what world they had originally come from, no one knew, but they trickled in from the direction of the South and Southwest. It seemed as if everyone were on the move at the, at the time. All sorts of people were gravitating towards the lakes from the nucleus of Mexico. So think about um, what we read last week as it pertains to the destruction of Black civilization, right? And it talks about how because of the land of Kemet, right, the riches of the land that brought everybody to Kemet, right? And, and this overpopulating of Kemet produces the push and pull factors that force migration. We have the same thing kind of going on here in this text, right? They're saying that everyone in Mexico were moving, excuse me, from the nucleus of Mexico towards the lakes, right? And they're saying that these African merchants, these West African Mali merchants first came in twos, and then in small bands, right? Um, and again, how they presented themselves was more of what caught the attention of the natives. Um, the capacity that what they were trading and what they had were possessed by the kings and the noblemen and the royalty of that area, right? So this, in, in Van Sertima's estimation, 
points to the fact that these Mandingo traders already had exchange conversation and trade with the, the with the kings and queens, right? In fact, it would be natural to assume that they got the blessing to go into those spaces by trading with the kings and queens, right? Vastly different from the ways that oftentimes Europeans would come in um, with their missionaries, right? Converting the um, royalty to their religion and then conquering. You no, know, they got the blessing from the king and then uh, begin to integrate themselves into the community. Um, looking on the bottom of page 94, it says, uh, but the blacks had built a temple in the town as soon as they formed a sizable capula, C-A-P-U-L-L-I, that just means like a small community, right? Or, or a sizable community. In the forecourt of this temple, they set up a wo the wooden statue of a werewolf who was their nagual or, or like their god, right? This statue fascinated him. So this is the part of the narrative that, that Noeli, Nolani was pointing us to. Um, Looking on page 95, right? Um, continuing the same narrative, um, it was not long before they were drawn also to their Nagual and began to join in their rituals and fest festivities. Even though he himself had never worshipped the Coyote Nagual, these were the men with whom he eventually did most of his businesses, and they had become his good friends. Now, this is kind of like how um, Chancellor Williams talks about how Islam began to influence Africa, right? So if you're doing trade with these Islamic people who speak Arabic, over time, you're going to learn some of their language just to allow you to do the trade, right? The same thing is taking place here with a gentleman who's observing the Mandingo and the Malians come into the, the region, right? And he's doing trade with them, so he's learning their customs to increase his capacity for trade. Um... Now, also like the destruction of Black civilization on page 95, towards the um, end of the third paragraph, by certain mistakes, there were daughters of the feather workers who had been taken to wife by the Blacks. Thus, had the gods and rituals of the natives and foreign of the Ponteca and the Amanteca slowly fused. So through marriage, right, they begin to see these cultural um, confluence be produced. I want to point out this really important part on page 96. It is with Mexico, however, that we are most concerned for here, for here, we can see the confluence of culture, not just the confluence of blood. When we compare the cult of the werewolf, the coyote of the prairies, found among the Amenteca with the cult of the werewolf, the hyena of the savannas, found among the Bambara of medieval Mali, we see quite clearly that we are at the high, the very head of that confluence. So let's kind of focus on this, this top portion, right? And as we're thinking about this top portion, again, I'm going to take us back to last week and the destruction of Black civilization and think about the, the, the Asian descendant migrants, right, who would marry into the African royal families, right? And they would marry into the African royal family so that way they had access to the African resources, right? Because you would not get access to land, you would not get access to power if you were not part of the bloodline. So we'll marry in, right? So that's not abnormal to have blood, mixture of blood. That's not abnormal, right? But with it, with Van Sertima is saying, the confluence of culture is what becomes important. Because again, think of it this way. Interracial dating, right? Interracial relationships, right? You could have that mixed baby, but that does not necessarily mean that you respect the culture of the other person. Does that make sense? So again, I'll say that one more time. Hope you hear me. Example that I'm trying to help you to understand this, interracial relationships. You could have that mixed baby. The blood can be combined. That does not mean that one group respects the culture of the other group. This is why you have things, especially, so I'm thinking about to like 2020, right? When we had the whole George Floyd summer, we had no sports. Everyone had to sit and watch the protests that were taking place in the street. And what I was being attentive to on Twitter was how many black women who had been in relationships with white men 
married, whole nine, kids, whole nine. I can't believe how racist my husband is. I've been married with him all this time. I can't believe how racist he is. So for me, these are examples of how you could have children with someone. You could combine the blood, but still not respect the culture. So what Van Serta, Van Serta is trying to get us to realize is where you see real true appreciation is the ability and the capacity to respect one another's culture. Because as someone pointed out, and it may have been Nolani, that they begin to appreciate each other's religious practices, right? So hence, on the bottom part of that um, pa paragraph that I just read, when we compare the cults of the werewolf, the coyote of the prairies, found among them are Amanteca, so the religion of the werewolf, right, that the indigenous people practiced in Mexico, because the coyote is the werewolf of the prairies, right? So in Mexico, there's no savannas. They have prairies, though. So the closest thing that they would have to a werewolf in the prairies would be the coyote, right? And you compare that with the cult of the werewolf, the hyena of the savanna, because, again, there's no coyotes in Africa, but there are hyenas and there are savannas, right? Found amongst the bombara of medieval Mali. So... In Mali, they practice the um, cult of the werewolf, but they use the hyena, right? We see clearly that we are at the head of this confluence. This is the greatest example of these two cultures respecting and honoring one another. They shape their religious practices to mirror one another. So when you talk about cultural confluence, this is more important for Van Sertima. Yeah, you could talk about folks coming together to make babies. For him, that's not as important. And again, this is why I brought up they came, um, the destruction of Black civilization. The Asian descended folks went into Africa with the intent to make babies solely for the purpose to control African resources, to abstract African power. That does not mean that they respect the culture of the Africans. I'm going to put a pause there because um, I do want to leave time for fishbowl. We could talk about anything that I mentioned in the lecture. Um, you could talk about what was discussed in your breakout groups. We could talk about, uh, you could just read your journal. All that's on the table. Uh, you have to do two per semester. You have one time to pass. Um, I'll take three volunteers. If there's no volunteers, I'll call that random. Uh, does anybody want to fishbowl? All right, so Berto. Anyone else? Valerie, one more. I will. I'm sorry, who said that? Uh, Shy? Uh, yeah. So we'll go in that order. Filberto, Valerie, then Shy. Uh, Filberto, you can start us off. Um, you, you speak of, like towards the end about this idea of uh, like respect for one another's cultures as opposed to just, uh, you know, the big idea not being uh, like merging blood or, you know, having kids. Um. I think it just tells us that whether it's power, money, or, uh, you know, resources, uh, there was definitely exterior motives when it comes to uh, civilizations such as, like, uh, Arabs, Asians, and Europeans, um, as opposed to, like, these cultures, uh, you know, the medieval uh, Mexico or, or the, the Western Africans. There was no exterior motives, you know. They were just in it to genuinely learn this idea of knowledge, the na, right? Um, they were there to take in uh, uh, this culture as a whole and, you know, learn from one another, build off of one another, as opposed to these kind of like greedy uh, Europeans or Arabs or Asians just looking for this exterior motive, um, marrying just for something else, power. You know, I think uh, there's a there's something beautiful in that because then yeah like in today's in today's world we could build off of that right like if we were able to do it then what what's to say that we can't do it now as opposed to bring each other down or you know it's 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 more important now to come together like in terms of for example the ballot because it's hard to avoid stuff like that and so we have to come together like in these moments in order to you know not be minoritized and eventually come out not on top because it's not a question of power but just you know live amongst another yeah 
about the ability to live and the ability to exist. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Valerie? What I thought was interesting was when the text started talking about like the origin of words and it got into linguistics, like a proof that cultures were being mixed and that cultures were learning things from each other is simply in the language. Yeah. We had so many words that connected like the indigenous people, the African language, Arabic, like these words were connecting. And it brought me back to this moment in, I know this is weird, but in fifth grade, I had this teacher, her name was Miss Ballora. I hated Miss Ballora. And she had this whole lesson for like a month where it was like, every word is from Greek and Roman roots and we're gonna learn all the Greek and Roman roots. And I remember thinking like, this is not true. Like, not that this isn't true, but this is so dumb. <laughs> like, like this has to be like, this is so redundant. We learned it for months. And anytime you would argue, she would get like genuinely mad. And I just thought like, I wish I could show her this text. Like the whole time I was reading, I was like, I wish I could go back in that moment and like spill some knowledge as a fifth grader. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now I, I have several of those moments, Valerie. Um, but and I think to your point, right? Like, even the idea that the so-called Greco-Roman civilization got their knowledge and their information from Africa turns all of those type of notions that language comes out of Greek and Roman culture on its head. Um, Shy. <clears throat> what I found interesting in the text was the um i don't i don't know how to pronounce it the max Slee, mm -hmm. um which um the text says it means in american language of not how to means a waist cloth of to hide the nudity uh -huh. and it's basically like a garment that women put over their private parts as an intimate adornment and it's like it's it's crazy to think how far back that goes like just like just the um the what's it called the the intimate like I don't know the words try, trying to put the word to the idea the intimate and feminine type of clothing that has dated back all the way back to these times you know how that kind of just stays and and evolves into what it is today, which is like, you know, just regular underwear. Well, but it kind of I'm hmm? Wait, I'm it kind of um brought me back to what uh Valerie was saying about the origin of words, but not even the origin of words, but just the origin of of everyday things that we use in today's world and kind of seeing how something as simple as underwear was portrayed or kind of viewed in that time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, ask you all a question. Not thinking in terms of identity. Hear me out clearly. Not thinking in terms of identity. How else in the American language or in the English language, do we use the terms race? Not talking about identity. How else do we use the word race in the English language? Say that out loud for me, Amelia. Running. Running. Or in another word to state that is competition, right? Because when you're racing, you're running to see who's the fastest. If it's a race car, right, you're driving the car to see the fat, who's the fastest. So competition is central to this notion. Why do you think that they would use this term race or competition to signify our ethnic identity? To show kind of this love, this idea of levels or hierarchy, you know, um, whites whites are on top you know you and everything else under that right because they want this idea that they are the the prophets they are as we saw like in religion at that time they were um the chosen ones so to kind of crystallize this a little bit further right we have so-called folks who occupy white bodies at the top of this racial um, hierarchy the rest are at the bottom right and it, and it has its hierarchy within that, right? So it's the old adage, um, 
if you write, sorry, if you white, you write. If you yellow, you mellow. If you brown, you can stick around. If you black, get back. This is something that I occurred growing up as it pertains to how this country structures race, right? So there's a hierarchy within that. But within this hierarchy, it's about establishing competition within those so-called minoritized groups. So the Black folks are in competition with the so-called Latinx folks, right? The Asian folks are in competition with the Arab folks, right? And all of these people who are not at the top are jockeying and fighting for resources. Capitalism as a system is dependent on the maintenance of competition. And this competition erodes our possibility to create these forms of connections. Valerie, say that out loud, please. Um, it's literally written in our constitution, but they don't refer to it as like different races. They refer to it as factions. It's in Federalist 10, which I think is written by Thomas Jefferson. And he literally states like the way we're going to keep control of the country is if we divide everybody into factions and make them worry about all these different issues because they will fight themselves as opposed to fighting us as the government. And that is literally what he says, like word for word. And this is in our constitution. So you don't have to take my word for it, right? Valerie just back, back it up using the words of the presidents themselves. Michelle, you gonna say something? You, you're on mute, I think. I, I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Me now. Yep. Okay. Okay, that's weird. Okay, so I was saying, um, that what she had just said is still prevalent today. Um, we still have people that are in these factions that are um, that are still opposed to each other instead of seeing what's really going on in the government. Um, I'm not really a much of a political person like my mother, but um, as as we can see, like during the the uh, the the during the Trump administration, we we didn't see what what. Well, a lot of people still don't see what's going what went down in the president uh Trump's presidency, and um people are still not seeing what's going on in the, today's political. Uh, my mom just spoke to me and she said that there's a lot of people my age that are choosing not to vote because they're claiming that there's not um good candidates for the president, um but people don't realize that if we don't vote, the wrong people will take office and our country is doomed. Not to um, push back against your moms, but to push back against your moms, right? Like, so out of the options that we have right now, both of them motherfuckers is bad, right? So, so no matter who you put in office, whether it's Sleepy Joe or the Orange motherfucker, that's a bad choice, okay. right? Right. So for me, and, and, I, and I'm not of your generation. I'm a little bit older than y'all. I'm probably mm -hmm. a lot older than y'all. I've never voted in my life, and I'm not saying this to tell you to vote, right? I've never voted. I didn't even fuck with Obama, right? The mm -hmm. reason being is because I understand the power in my vote. I understand the importance of politics. So if there's no one that's gonna support my agenda as an African descendant person, you don't deserve my vote. You don't deserve it. And, and I'm not going to play the game of the least of the two evils. That don't make sense to me. Give me a better option. So to me, instead of saying, oh, you have to choose one, what young people should de be demanding is a better option. Give me someone who speaks to my needs, even if we have to create a third party, right? And, and, and again, I respect your mom's opinion, um, mm -hmm. but I, I have to dis I have to respectfully disagree, right? Because I understand the power of my vote. What did What did Obama do for Black people? I don't even know. I was too young. <laughs> I could tell you, I was alive. Obamacare. <laughs> yeah. But outside of that, not a goddamn thing. He gave, he gave us phones. He gave us what? Phones. Phones. Yeah, that, that's a problem within itself. Shit, that's what's wrong. <laughs> right? I do know that Trayvon Martin was murdered under Obama's presidency. True. He said, well, if I had a son, my son would look like Trayvon. But he did nothing to go get that motherfucker who killed Trayvon. So if the president who looks like you does nothing for you, what the fuck are we doing? 
I'm not going to waste my political participation in that. So I refuse. Um, I want to point out one more thing. One second. And I think this is important, especially when you're talking about like they came before Columbus and evidence of our presence here in the Americas. These are what's called the Olmec heads. These are um, built in the central Mexico region that we're reading about. Um, look at the features of these statues. Look at the very broad nose. Look at the very oh, thick lips, right? That's what I saw in the documentary. That's mm -hmm. what they were. There's a museum actually that has that um, there in Mexico. And I mean, these things are huge, huge, like, like taller than a basketball court. Um, it, it's are huge. If you look at the back of the head, what does that look like? What type of hairstyle is that? Braids, cornrows. Yep. So tell me that these folks ain't black. Tell me that this is not physical, archaeological evidence of an African presence in this region of Mexico. Now, the absurdity of Western schools of thought says that a big stone rolled down a mountain and as it rolled down the mountain those images were carved into the face the braids were carved into the head by it simply rolling down the mountain does that shit make logical sense to y'all <laughs> no it must like, have been high <laughs> oh, i don't even if you're high right like i don't, I don't I think, like i don't know what you smoking to, to come up with that one right like so this is to me the equivalent of the notion that the aliens came down and built the pyramid, right? This is all done in attempts to dehumanize and discredit the ancient African presence in this world, right? So again, I can't overemphasize the importance of honoring culture. It's vastly important. It's different from making mixed babies, right? Like there, there's a vast difference between these two realities. So Question basically you could ahead. still, not to interrupt, because um, I've been having this argument with my brothers like for months now. My, um, I had told my brother that I don't mind dating outside my race as long as um, the man respects and understands my culture and vice versa. My brother was like, you should never mix because it's, it's, um, it's, it's not, uh, what do you say? It's not right. It's not right for black people to enter race. And I'm like, there, we do it all the time. And, and we've been doing it since ancient times. But I mean, as long, I feel like as long as you respect that person and their culture, then there's nothing wrong. Yes. In an ideal world, Michelle, in an ideal world, you're absolutely right. But that's not the world that we live in. No. And there is a racial hierarchy in the way that we understand social conditions in this country, right? And unfortunately for African descendant po folks, we're at the bottom of that hierarchy, right? And evidence to this stems from comments like, ooh, I'm gonna get me a white boy so my baby could have good hair. Heard that before? I'm gonna get me a white boy so my yes. baby could be light-skinned, right? Oh, yes, too many times. So what that speaks to is the presence of that hierarchy. So a part of this desire for interracial relationships is to climb up the social ladder. Mm. So if I could remove this blackness from me through, matter of fact, y'all know Patrick Mahomes? Isn't yeah. he that white? Yeah. By, yeah. Uh, what is a football player? Mm -hmm. Super Bowl MVP, look at his daddy. Google Patrick Mahomes' dad and then Google Patrick Mahomes' children and see how this notion of mixing plays out. Patrick Mahomes in two generations effectively has removed his blackness. So yeah, I feel you in this world that we could all just get along and it, and it don't matter, but it don't play out like that for both sides. Because oftentimes what happens with black women, with white men, they get eroticized. They're my little plaything. It's kind of what it is. So if you can find somebody who truly, truly, truly respects your culture, mm -hmm. right, 
who who don't mind seeing you in that bonnet in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. who don't mind you moving through the house with your slides and, and, and these true aspects of black culture, then that right. makes it different. But I would argue it'd be very hard to find. Furthermore, that's what I'm and I and I agree. And I, I had told my brother, it is it is going to yes, it is extremely hard to find someone who respects a person as a black um as a black person. And um, because he was trying to say, are you trying to erase your blackness? And I said, no, I'm not trying to really erase my blackness. I love being black. I would love. I told him when I marry, I want to marry a black man. But I, at this point, I'm not marrying someone. And at this point, I don't see marriage in my future, which is at this point, um, which is why I don't mind dating outside my race because it's like you never know who might be your soulmate, and they might not be black. So, and that's what I try to tell him. And he's like, well, that sounds like you're trying to. Uh, what is it made outside your race your race and I'm like you need to educate yourself because there are a lot of black people out there that still love and respect their culture and their spouses are not black and also respect their culture I mean not this, a lot Michelle. but let me ask you this Michelle how mm -hmm. much can you love black people if you don't make a black person that's a difficult question just saying Anybody, anybody else want to chime in? Julian, what are your thoughts? Mr. Bustos, what are your thoughts on our conversation that's happening right now? Close this up. My shit was on mute. My bad, my bad. Um, let's see. I had a lot of thoughts. Um, What's your ethnic background, Julian? I'm half Mexican, half black. What, who do you live with? Who do I live with? So you're saying, what do I identify more with? What do mm -hmm. I think I'm more? Like, what, if, if, the, if the household is separate, mm -hmm. which one do you live with? If it's separate. Well, it was like half and half all my life. Okay. So... Um, right now I live with my mom, okay. so my mom's black, my dad is Mexican. Um, growing up, I was with my Mexican side a lot because that's when my that's when my my grandma was alive. So that means all my cousins, all my siblings, we all were with my grandma, and we all grew up like little Mexican babies, little Mexican kids. I'm not gonna lie. And then when she passed away in like seventh grade, that's when I was with my mom's side a lot more. So I would say I got like both cultures like a lot, like heavily instilled instilled in me. So to prove my point and not to like talk bad about your your side of your family, Julian, but just to prove my point, right? Until you were seven, you didn't really know about your blackness because you Oh no. Oh no, I grew up. Now my mama made sure. She my mama made sure that I grew up pro black and all all of that. My mama didn't play none of that. But so let me ask you I'm this. saying like I'm saying like I was more way. like let me ask you this way then just to get to my point, because I know we're over time. Did you know about your blackness from your indigenous side? Did, I, did my, you're saying did my Mexican side tell me about my blackness? Or you about no, your, my, Me you said what? Did they talk to you about your blackness, about your African? Oh no, they were racist. I'm not gonna lie, they were racist. They were racist, they didn't even like my mom. Um, yeah, my, Me my Mexican side was very racist to my, to my mom. So that's my point, right? And, and, and again, I'm not trying to talk bad about side your family, Julian. All I'm trying to do is point to the reality that these racial hierarchies are still in play, even when that family has that baby. Yeah, I'm already knowing. They didn't start being racist until I was alive. Mind you, I already have a, I have a brother that's six years older than me. So they didn't like my mom at all. But I knew that growing up. My dad, my mom used to tell me Mexicans are racist. My dad used to tell me Mexicans are racist. Like, well, they just don't, they didn't like black people. I don't know. I don't know. At least over there in the Bay Area, they didn't like. Black folks. And so, I'll say this, bro. It's worse out here than it is in the Bay Area. Because I think I in the Bay Area, one of the differences, they come together around this identity of being from the Bay Area. You can you you will renite from the fact that we've all from the Bay. So there's a level of connection there. Right. Man, it ain't that. Um, just for sake of time, because I know you went hella 